Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the wireless networking professional. We aim to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Get ready to listen and enjoy. Now to our host of the show, Keith Parsons. Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly. This is episode number one. My name is Keith Parsons, and I'll be your host today. Today's podcast starts with a couple of fun little definitions from Joel Barrett, a rant on wrong acronyms. Then we're going to lead into a first topic by Avert Bopp on the past, present, and future of hotspots. A couple interesting facts, a little elevator speech by Adam Conway of uh, Arrowhive, and then followed by a soft segment from Devin Aiken. Uh, those of us who have uh, known Devin for a while, known he's uh, very technical, understands the technical side of it. But today's segment is on It's All About the People, and it's more of a soft skill side. So without further ado, let's get on to the, the rest of the show. Today's wireless networking definition from the CWNP Dictionary of Wireless Terms and Acronyms. This is Joel Barrett, and today's term is CAPLAP. This is the control and provisioning of wireless access points. It's an IETF draft. Actually, it's an IETF standard now and uh, was ratified in 2008. It addresses standardization of lightweight access point control and defines how WLAN data traffic is managed over the back end network. It's closely related to LWAP. So if you want to find more information about CAPWAP, check out LWAP in the CWNP dictionary. So this is Joel Barrett for the CWNP Dictionary, and tune in again for the CWNP Dictionary Term of the Day. Rant, pet peeve, what really bugs you? 60 seconds of complaining starts now. Hello, this is Keith Parsons. Something that really bugs me is when people in professional situations use the wrong sounding acronyms. If you were a doctor and you wouldn't call a medical device by the wrong sound, by the wrong name, even though the general population might. We live in the wireless LAN world, and in our world we have things like access points. And if you shorten that down, the correct way to call it is an AP. It's not an app, and it's definitely not a WAP. I mean, are there non-wireless access points? If you continue to call things WAPs or apps, you might as well go get yourself a job working at uh, Best Buy or an Office Max to sell there. In a professional world, you need to call them by the correct name. WAP is a protocol used for cell phones to talk and send HTML over the cell phone network. An app is an application. An SSID is not a SID. A SID is a specific hardware identifier on Windows boxes. So, in our world, it's SSID, and that's the way you say it. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. Today's topic is the past, present, and future of wireless hotspots, brought to us by Avert Bopp. He's the CEO of a... Wi-Fi hotspot operator in Ireland called Air Apps, A-I-R-A-P-P-Z, and you can find links in the show notes to Avert's website. Avert, thanks for joining us today from Cool Bond in Ireland. Okay, yes. Well, wireless hotspots uh, and public wireless access, where has it been? Where does it come from and where is it going? Uh Personally, I mean, I started providing or installing wireless hotspots uh, in 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 Ireland in a few hotels uh, back in, I would say, 1999-2000, where they were fairly new. Uh, at the time, it was basically it's very clunky equipment. Uh, what you what you quite often did is buy a, a Cisco box or something similar, uh, wireless access point, hook it up to a network, and uh, give it an SSID, and that was basically it. That there was the, there wasn't really such functionality as captive portals unless you wanted to work with uh, some of the open source software. Uh, but basically, that was it. You know, an SSID, somebody could pick it up and connect. Uh, there wasn't anything fancy about, to it. Then slowly, over the next year or so, it kind of started to develop uh, in where people like myself or and, and others started to work with uh, 
kind of homebrew equipment. We used to buy mini PCs, uh, Linux on them, and uh, hack away at open source software, uh, pick up exo- exotic kind of drivers for sp- specific Wi-Fi cards and build our own boxes. Uh, one of the interesting projects I was involved in around that time was a, uh, um, a project here in Ireland called the Irish One, which was basically a bunch of geeks living in out in the sticks in, in Ireland where we had no internet access. So what we used to do, for instance, is we we found somebody in the nearest city uh, who could get a, a DSL line, which was which was the be all and end all of, of broadband in Ireland at the time, and uh, we would find one of those uh, somebody, like I said, in the city and. Uh, by the, basically get them set up with one or two DSL lines stick an omnidirectional or directional antenna or a bunch of directional antennas up in their roof and shoot out point to point links across the countryside uh, ranging from 2 to 3 miles to out to one we did I think was 11 or 12 miles and eventually we hook up a whole bunch of geeks with a whole lot of uh, home built Wi-Fi equipment uh, and route all the traffic to the, the single or multiple DSL lines, which was interesting, not very commercially attractive, but I mean, we got all got hooked up and we, we all got to share a bit of broadband. Uh, but what that did, it, it, it taught me a lot about building your own s- uh, systems and using uh, kind of open source software and thinking away at it rather than just going what's available with the market. Uh, then uh, I kind of saw... Uh, public Wi-Fi access in places like hotels and restaurants and bars become more uh, more of a commonplace. Uh, I did some work with a Dutch company uh, in, in uh, first basically the first Wi-Fi hotspot provider in Holland called Hub Pop at the time. They eventually bought up by KPN. But the whole thing kind of became a bit more sophisticated. You used uh, People started using uh, captive portals. They started using walled gardens where... Uh, People could log on and maybe see a few websites for free before they actually have to pay. Uh, the payment systems were rolled out. Uh, the authentication systems were, were uh, um, basically more became more sophisticated. But what also happened is that people actually learned more about the specifics of wireless. That wireless wasn't just an automatic extension of a cable internet connection that, that providing uh, in connectivity to a wireless medium had its own intricacies that you had to look at, uh, such things as radio spectrums and how do radio waves behave and how does it propagate and what interference you have. So that I kind of specialised in that, that area and uh, um, I got more involved with, uh, on a consultancy basis with, with a number of projects across the globe, which gave me a nice overview of the way it was going. Uh, but the way to get back to my topic, where is where is Wi-Fi, uh, public Wi-Fi access going, and uh, the whole hotspot industry? Uh, uh, I think it's going more and more towards the free model, which is something that I've been pushing for for years. Because uh, the actual cost of providing Wi-Fi access in a public venue is relatively low. I mean, there's the initially set up cost, but once you got the equipment in place and you have a, a decent enough backhaul connection, uh, you're talking in, in uh, the, the day-to-day running cost is, in, in Europe, of course, is a couple of euros, a couple of bucks in the States. So if, if from a business perspective, if you look at it as the owner of a hotel or a, a restaurant or a bar, by, if you, by spending those few bucks a day, can actually attract more customers and actually attract customers with quite often higher spend rate, you might get uh, get business people who basically would have to choose between a hotel without Wi-Fi or paid Wi-Fi or a hotel with a free service. And obviously, uh, most of them, if not all of them, will choose for the free service. So, you know, if you're a hotel and you provide free Wi-Fi, you will get more customers. You will get customers that will spend more. So that's kind of the, the way I see, the uh, in short, the, the public hotspot sector going. That's good. In fact, I like the idea that it's more like a having a public bathroom it's just yes. a service you have to you have to have it to be in business uh, there is a cost Absolutely. but but it Absolutely. has value too yeah. and then you're you're different if you don't have it exactly i mean it's the point now it's gone to the stage where uh, it used to be the play, the locations with public wifi would be the exceptions and it's gone the other way around now and again the public bathroom example is the one that i use a lot uh, uh, would you go to a hotel or bar where you had to pay to go to the toilet? You wouldn't. Simple. And it's, and it's, it's, that's basically it. And I've done some calculations, and in some of the larger hotels, the costs of actually maintaining and 
the, the bathrooms and keeping them clean is quite often more uh, higher than the cost of running a, a free public wi- a Wi-Fi service. Those are some unique stat- statistics. I would also yes. comment on that. Uh, there are still hotels that charge to go to the bathroom. I mean, they, they still do that. There's gas stations that charge to go to the bathroom or they have you know locks on the bathroom doors. I can see that some uh, you know hotels and hospitality will, will have some restrictions on their Wi-Fi access. But for the most part, it just needs to be free. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, hotel bathrooms locked. We have those here. Luckily, we don't have to pay for them anymore. But uh, uh, what also is quite often happens with large hotel chains, and I've seen it with a few of them, and, and uh, the Four Seasons here in Ireland uh, is, is the same as probably most of the Four Seasons across the world, is that they outsource the actual management of their uh, public Wi-Fi access to uh, an aggregator who then charge, basically slaps their own charge on it. And uh, I had the, the pleasure again staying in the Four Seasons in Dublin uh, uh, not so long ago in a room that was luckily uh, paid for by uh, the event provider. Uh, but it was, A, it was an expensive room, and B, then to find out that actually to use the Wi-Fi in the room would cost me uh, not upwards from, I think it was 25 euros a day. Ouch. Which is silly. <laughs> yes. And it wasn't even fast. It was like, uh, supposed to be one, uh, one meg connection, and it didn't even get anywhere near that. Well, that's a, because you were sharing with everyone else who was paying 25 euros a day. Yeah, exactly. Well, and uh, that's a bit silly, because even, like, they had two. They had the, the Wi-Fi, the wireless internet, and the wired internet. And it was the same. Even the, uh, all the ethernet ports were uh, routed to a captive portal where you had to pay an X amount to, to actually use it. And it's really the backhaul off the hotel that's going to make all the difference anyway. Yeah, and, and basically, I mean, once they have installed it, it's not going to cost them anything more or less uh, if they charge for it. So, you know, they might as well provide it for free because people are going to, watch, going to look at it and go, uh, okay, it's too expensive, I won't use it. Especially now with, uh, in Ireland, and I, I, I don't know exactly how it is all over the, the US at the moment, but uh, the, the 3G slash LTE slash uh, UMTS uh, networks have uh, made a huge inroad here where everybody is using this, these mobile broadband dongles uh, plugged into their laptops, and uh, especially in cities like Dublin, like, in Ireland, like, you know, like London, there is a reasonably good coverage. So people, if they have that service and it's a subscription based with no cap on it, they're they're more likely to use. I think the hotel room if you start using, if charging for your Wi-Fi. Yeah, I spend many nights in hotels and I take the dongle with me, and I would rather use the free Wi-Fi than the dongle because it's uh, more stable. But if they're yeah. going to charge, that's what the dongle's for. Exactly, and I mean, you know, you you were probably like me years ago where you used to go to hotels where there was no. Uh, dongle, uh, no uh, 3G service or Wi-Fi, uh, but there would, might be somebody across the road who had an unsecured Wi-Fi access point, and you would sit, pull a chair up to the window and put your laptop in the window and hope to pick up the connection there. But now with, with the, the, the variety of choice of, of, of different kinds of connectivity, yeah, I mean, charging for it, and especially in, 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 in a city where there's lots of different uh, methods of connectivity, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, we talked about the past of of hot spots in the present, yeah. what do you think's coming down in the future? Uh, one thing that's going to be big in the future is uh, is mobile Wi-Fi, as in uh, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots on trains, uh, on uh, buses, in taxis, uh, but also in cars. I mean, Ford announced was it last week or the week before that one of the new cars will have in in onboard Wi-Fi built in. You know, which kind of turns the car into a, a mobile hotspot. Now, immediately I started to think further and go, hey, what if they use meshing protocol and uh, create a whole lot of uh, ad hoc networks with, with different, uh, all types of the same mo- cars of the same model? But uh, it's, it's basically uh, comes and evolves from the idea where we have LTE networks, where we have, we'll have WiMAX, we'll have other kind of uh, higher capacity uh more backhaul systems that use uh, the wire, uh, radio spectrum rather than cable spectrum, which is, gives Wi-Fi uh, hotspots an, an, an excellent medium to tap into. Uh, I mean, for years, everybody was saying that uh, 3G or UMTS or WiMAX would kill Wi-Fi. And now that it's actually becoming more widespread, what you actually see is that everybody's coming up with devices that use WiMAX or uh, 3G and then convert it to a Wi-Fi signal. 
because there's millions and millions of Wi-Fi clients out there. Uh, I mean, you have all the laptops with Wi-Fi built in, you have all the PDAs, you have all those iPhones, millions and millions of iPhones with Wi-Fi in there. So everybody wants Wi-Fi and doesn't really care what the further backhaul is. And uh, if that backhaul is a radio spectrum, then you can make that whole service more mobile. I like it. One of the, the problems I see in that scenario, though, is the iPhones at least have a web browser that when if you hit a captive portal, that you can at least uh, get through it. There's a lot of PDA devices and other mobile devices that uh, don't have the capacity to hit a captive portal, and so you're kind of stuck on and not actually being able to use the Wi-Fi. True, true. There's, but the there's, there's solution that I'm actually working at the moment with a new company that's uh, uh, spinning out of one of the, the universities in Ireland, which, which has developed a kind of a one-click or no-click uh, authentication system, which basically means you you uh, it's very early stage, so I can I uh, there's any too much much specific I can say about it. But basically, what it is, you install a small client on your device, and it can be uh, a device with a browser, or it could even be a VoIP phone or anything like that. And when it basically comes in, in reach of in range of uh, a Wi-Fi service, or this could even work with 3G, but uh, this is specifically developed for Wi-Fi. If it comes in, in in range of a Wi-Fi system that it's subscribed to call it that to the service, uh, it will uh, seamlessly connect. So you you don't have to uh, go to a uh, captive port and auth- authentication system. So this is something that we we hopefully we we will be trying to to sell to some of the. Uh, hotspot providers or the, uh, the mobile Wi-Fi providers, and uh, which is uh, if they basically roll their servers into the... It's a kind of a backend that they can act to add to their existing backend, and then it will allow a whole lot of browserless devices to, to seamlessly uh, uh, still use their service or authenticate, and then they all, the whole billing system is included with that. So that would kind of uh, get rid of that uh, kink in the cable. That uh, I'm looking forward to having that happen because uh, personally I would, I would rather just have free Wi-Fi and I call it real free Wi-Fi that you just connect and it runs. Yes, uh, Like the old days, like you'd mentioned, you just, you know, borrowing from a neighbor. Uh, it just yes. worked. You didn't have to do anything Absolutely. about it. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, there's no accounting and there's no authentication. There's no accountability, no. but it was easy. Yes, absolutely. And and there you said accounting and accountability is, is a big issue now. In, I mean, it's in the States too, but in Europe now with the, the EU legislation, and we've, we've you know, spoken about this in the past, Kate, is that the EU law actually, uh, or the EU introduced data retention law where uh, telecoms providers, and that can be phone, fax, email, internet access providers, have to retain uh, all users' data uh, for a certain period, I think it's, uh, it's it's up to a year, which basically means if you use email to your provider, your provider has to basically say who, where, what, and for how long. Now, that doesn't mean they have to contain, for instance, the content of the email, but they have to, for instance, say, like, you, say, Avert Bob or Keith Parsons, connected from this location at this time and send an email to there, to the recipient. Now, it sounds very big brother, and I mean, I'm not too happy about it, but, you know, it's the, the law is the law, so we have to kind of deal with this. This also means that hotspot uh, Wi-Fi providers have to keep track of their users. So you do need an authentication system. You don't need a billing system. You can do that for free, but you need a system where the user uh, registers once and then logs in every time they use the service again. And it can be a seamless login like we just talked, spoke about, or it can be to a, ca- a captive portal and the, the traditional kind of login systems. But that, by having that authentication system uh, process every time, allows uh, the service provider to retain the user data. And, and you have important. additional statistics that you can you know, track and turn in and show exactly, how much volume that's exactly. being in there. So, I mean, it's, it's positive yes. as well. Uh, but you do Absolutely. have to have the user name, their actual real name, or their email address. What's yes. We have to basically, when, when, uh, what we advise providers to do, and that's what we do, is basically the one-time registration where we get some kind of identification details. Uh, and that's, that can vary. I mean, we've, we've rolled out systems where basically uh, the user registers and provide a mobile phone number, and that's where we send uh, the authentication details to. Or it can be via email where they register, and then they get five minutes access to check their email and get the, get the registration. It's it's not a hundred percent perfect. It's there's flaws in it. I mean, people can use generic emails like Gmail and etc. And it's still 
untraceable. But, you know, it gives the provider departments when they come not and go, listen, I've done my best. This is the data. You know, rather than going by every user, going to the house and checking if they really are who they say they are, this is as good as it gets. And that's fair enough. That sounds good. Well, we've talked about the past and the present and the the future of uh, hotspots, especially there in in your side of the world, in uh, Ireland and Europe. Uh, Any final things you want to say about uh, where hotspots are going, LTE versus WiMAX? Any predictions? Uh yeah, well, I mean, one thing I did, I did the cliche thing in the end of December day on my blog, and I put my five top five tech predictions uh, for 2010. Oh, let's hear them. Uh, the, sorry? Let's hear them. Uh, I just have to call. I mean, one of them basically is that uh, 2010 is going to be the biggest year for Wi-Fi so far, in my opinion, uh, especially because, A, like I said, uh, the v- availability of wireless backhaul to various mediums will make... Uh, open up new doors for, for Wi-Fi, but also, and this is uh, what I've learned through discussions with uh, various uh, mobile broadband providers who use such things as 3G, etc., etc., and uh, 3G, like the more, the dongles have taken off hugely here. They're, they've gone through a growth that uh, that's fairly unprecedented, and uh, almost everybody has one which has led to the problem that the network has become overloaded or very close to being overloaded, uh, and uh, which means that uh, providers have to look at, okay, if this cell or this base station is reaching 90% capacity and growing, how much is it going to cost us to upgrade it to handle the, the increased capacity? And is that money, is it worth it? Is there a return on investment? And quite often there isn't because uh, the service has been sold for like 25 euros a month subscription which oh, does that have a cap on it at 25 uh it normally has depending on provider it has one to five gig cap on it uh but which is surprising me for you and me it wouldn't be much but for the average user it's it stays under that quite uh, regularly and that means they, they're making me maybe you know a couple of bucks a month on on, on service so to put a hundred, hundred fifty thousand euros into upgrading each base station uh, is just not worth it. So there's a movement now, or a school of thought within the the, the telcos now to offload that capacity onto uh, uh, existing Wi-Fi networks, where they're looking at means to basically install clients on the devices that, when a 3G device comes within range of a Wi-Fi device with a strong enough signal, to basically uh, seamlessly switch over to that. So that's. Uh, basically shows that one of the so-called big threats to Wi-Fi is actually now going to push Wi-Fi uh, traffic back to Wi-Fi because they can't handle the volume they're getting. That's amazing. So that's that. yeah. Yes, and, and, and I mean, I've had heard that from a number of, of uh, telecos who, who, who are basically fairly big in providing uh, uh, mobile broadband to the 3G dongles. And it's in Ireland, it's in, in the UK, it's in, uh, in, it's in Germany and most of the European countries. And Basically, uh, I would say it's the same in the U.S. Uh, I don't know. How, how popular are dongles in the U.S. Oh, now? Very, very popular. Uh, they cost yeah. a little more. Uh, I, I still have a couple of plans that are truly unlimited. Most of them mm-hmm. say they're unlimited, but they give you a five gig cap. Uh, yeah. And for most people, you're right. That that does most of their work unless they're doing mm-hmm. a lot of streaming. So. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, that's and because that low price and the, and, and the ease to use, it's just become so popular that it's overloading door networks. Uh, but anyway, that's like I said, that's, that's three reasons. The overload uh, on the, the, the 3G networks were being pushed back to Wi-Fi and availability of such services as, as WiMAX and LTE, which, which will be used as backhaul for uh, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, increases the actual scope for Wi-Fi. You don't no longer have to put it in a fixed location. You can put it in a mobile uh, vehicle. You can put it in locations where you, you didn't have broadband before, but you can now pl- uh, connect it to a Wi-Fi uh, service. So the, the whole market for Wi-Fi will be blown wide open. Uh, I see a huge growth. I mean, literally worldwide, I see about 25 to 40 percent growth in the market over the, over the next year, and that will uh, hopefully continue for the next uh, the, for the years after. Well, I hope so. so that's, rather than, that's kind of where yeah. our audience is, and we're all kind of glad to hear that 2010 is going to be the year of Wi-Fi. Yeah. Now, the, the second prediction I had for 2010 uh, is not directly linked to Wi-Fi, but slightly related, is that uh, I think, and <laughs> you're probably going to laugh at me saying this, that uh, this year will be the first year that the uh, market share for the Apple iPhone will actually shrink rather than grow. 
and I see that towards the end of the year uh, for two reasons. One is one of the issues that I myself and a few and quite a few people I've spoken to have is that uh, to use and the device, the Apple iPhone, which is a fantastic, technically a fantastic device, but to use it to its full potential, you need to jailbreak it. You need to get out of that fact where Apple decides what software you can use on and whatnot, and that you have to buy everything to uh, the iTunes or the uh, store or the App Store. And uh, they either Apple it needs to either open up that availability and let people use a much wider range of software devices on it. Or they're going to lose market share to the the new Android devices. I mean, obviously, Google, uh, the Google Phone, the Nexus One, is a big one, purely for the huge might uh, that that Google has and the power that Google puts behind it. But also, if you look for one of the uh, the new Android devices that was is being sold by one of the uh, telcos here in Ireland and in the UK, it's the HTC Hero, which is a phone that costs a uh, hundred bucks. It's got full Android capability, and it, it's amazing. I mean, I've used it, and, and I'm fairly blown away by it, while, while I wasn't blown away by the iPhone. And that's uh, 100 uh, unlocked? Uh, no, on a, on a prepay service. Unlocked is about 200. Oh, still very reasonable. Yes, and it's a very nifty device. It's got a lot of capabilities that are very similar to... Uh, uh, the iPhone, like, you know, the double taps, you can do the pinch thingy on your pictures, it has the, the home screens, it has the, uh, one thing that I liked is the, the Android apps to install them on the device, you don't have to go to a store environment, they are just shown on your device, you get this and go, okay, click, install this, boom, it's on there. So I find them much easier to use to the, than, than the iPhone, uh, could also be my physiology when one of the issues I had with the iPhone that my fingers constantly, constantly kept missing the keys on the touchscreen, but <laughs> that's just kind of personal thing. Yeah, it takes a little but, bit of practice. Yeah. So yeah, but, but the Nexus but, uh, One's the same way. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't I haven't tried the Nexus One obviously yet because it's a, you know it's it's not available in Ireland yet. There's a few Google people in uh, Google uh, European headquarters in Dublin who have been playing with it, but I haven't had my hands on one yet. But I mean. Apple, the iPhone will be big still, you know, will probably still be the biggest player in the market for a long time, but, but still, I think towards the end of the year, we'll see the market share uh, slightly decrease in favor of, of, of the various Android devices. Well, that's great. Uh, uh, let's just go there yeah. and let's leave a teaser. Where can they yeah. uh, find the rest of your predictions? Okay, well, my blog is basically, it's uh, avertb, so E-V-E-R-T-B, dot wordpress dot com, and it is the second blog post down i've done one uh, one since so they can just scroll down there and have a look at it that's, maybe that's great and where yeah. where can they uh find about air apps uh, air apps with a z at the end so a i r a p p z dot com well good well appreciate your yeah. time today we've uh no covered past present and future wi-fi uh with uh, aver bop of uh air apps out of ireland thank you and much like i said if anybody wants to follow me on twitter i'm aver b so at Everett B on Twitter. All right. Thank you very much, Everett. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Interesting facts, little known tidbits, things you might not have known, short little bits to set your mind a reeling. Uh, so a fun fact uh, that you may not know already is 802.11S uh, is for mesh networking. And uh, if you haven't read... Uh, 802.11s, the amendment, uh, you might be surprised to know that there's actually a whole lot of security enhancements uh, provided in there. Uh, so there are some some other things as well, like they introduced the mesh BSS as well as a new coordination uh, access method, uh, MCF, uh, that's mesh coordination function, but they also add some, some extra security enhancements. So they have the abbreviated handshake uh, and then the simultaneous authentication of equals, uh, SAE, uh, which is basically a peer-based authentication mechanism that's used for mesh networks. Elevator speech. Our guests have just two minutes to tell us all about their product or service offering. Ready, set, go. Arrowhive Networks is pioneering a next-generation wireless LAN architecture, an architecture that delivers upon wireless 2.0. Arrowhive's solution... Uh, provides all of the management, mobility, and security of controller-based architectures, but without the cost, capacity, and performance issues associated with controller deployments. 
Uh, in addition, the Arrowhive solution provides the reliability and scalability necessary for mission-critical networks and are optimized for voice over wireless LAN applications. Hey, being a professional means more than just knowing the technical. Now it's time to soften up and talk about the non-techie side for a minute. Slow down, put your feet up, and listen up to these items to help you on the professional side. Enjoy. Welcome back. Today's topic is Devin Aiken. He's the Chief Wi-Fi Architect at Arrowhive. And our subject today is It's All About the People. Devin, I've read one of your uh, blogs about this, and I think it's a good idea. And uh, I'm glad you're here to share this with us today. So go ahead, Devin. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. So today I want to talk about the the most important thing within a company. There's all kinds of answers to uh, to that, of course. Uh, you know, what is the most important company has? Uh, you might hear things like customer base, intellectual property, market share, uh, management team, the investors, how much cash a company has in the bank, and certainly there's others, uh, depending on what the, the most pressing issue of the day is. Being passionate about what I do, being highly opinionated, I don't think anybody's ever accused me of not having an opinion. You, I say not an opinion? <laughs> of course. No one would ever guess that. <laughs> so, so I say that the most important thing that a company has is its people. And, you know, of course, when I say it's people, I mean employees, volunteers, um, those people volunteering to work for a dollar a year uh, for a time and and all the rest. Um, And why do I think that? Well, I'll give you a series of questions that uh, that I think about that that leads me to this conclusion. Uh, Who found, you know, found and landed the customers? You know, who goes out and knocks on all those doors and makes those those calls? Who puts in the long hours and makes sure that the customers stay happy? You know, the support and the um, and things like this. Uh, who creates the intellectual property that the company owns? Um, who who puts in all these hours uh, to make the company all this money that puts the cash in the bank? Let employees do all that. And if an employee leaves, it's another employee who uh, picks up the ball and runs with it. The people are the most important thing uh, applies to the CEO and it applies to the shipping clerk. It applies to, to everyone from top to bottom of an organization. Um, it, it's people who make the uh, the world go around, and, and without the people, there's no company. Um, so uh, I, I think sometimes that that everybody within organizations forgets this sometimes, whether it's the, the guy at the bottom, you know, that just started on day one, um, or it's the guy who's been there 20 years. Uh, people forget that it's people that make companies. Well, of course, it's the people. It's uh, not just the people on the bottom. It's the people on the top. Uh, and what I've seen is some people uh, – had different attitudes when it comes to their work. Uh, what do you have to think about the attitude size of, of the people? Well, I think uh, there's a, a lot to be said about the attitude. Um, you know, sometimes people get uh, stuck in a position in a company. They've been there a while. They uh, Perhaps they're unhappy about uh, uh, their, their job or job you know position and things that they do. And uh, I think that uh, the, the best advice I can give a person like this, you know, because uh, – that situation lends itself to a bad attitude a lot of times, or at least not an optimal attitude, is is that, you know, people at the, the top of the corporate ladder, the vice presidents and, and CEO, they've all been there at one time or another. Nobody's born a CEO. So while you're learning how to do uh, the jobs, you know, different jobs in the company, um, those are the things that are going to make you more valuable later. If you've heard the stories about how, you know, Somebody starts in the mailroom and and after 30 or 40 years, they're the CEO uh, of a large company. The way that happened is by having a good attitude and by doing your job, even sometimes when you don't like what the job entails, but you do it to the best of your ability. You learn what the job uh, has to offer. You you learn that, then you move perhaps into uh, management of those positions, and then maybe you change departments after some time, and and you have to go through a role or two that you don't really care for there, and eventually you end up manager there because you know the most about that section. And as you work your way through a company, over time, uh, you can work your way to the top. And just because you're at the top now doesn't mean you haven't done jobs you didn't like uh, for periods of time that were probably not optimal, but you learned how to do all of the jobs. So now you're the most qualified person. Uh, to lead that organization. I think 
uh, by having a good attitude in whatever role or whatever uh, situation you find yourself, uh, those people that are your managers see that and they're going to reward that and they're going to move you up and you're going to have more opportunity because of it. Hope that uh, was oh. a, uh, a decent answer. No, that's a good answer. Uh, some of us out here in the uh, Wi-Fi professional world are, are wondering, hey, Devin's talking. He just moved to this new company. Are you talking specifically about your colleagues there at Arrowhive? Uh, ac- actually, I'm not. Uh, Arrowhive has been, uh, it's been very, very refreshing uh, since I got here. I've been here four months, and I've seen some pretty neat things here. Um, I've seen how uh, people help and complement each other, whether they work in the same department or not. I've seen people, for example, say something to somebody's manager uh, about what a great job they're doing, and uh, and that person may get promoted or get a raise. I've seen that happen. I've seen some some people go and make sure their manager is taken care of. I mean, how many times do you see somebody go and make sure that uh, that your that your manager? Uh, is okay. You know, the stress and the long hours and the, uh, you know, of a startup, especially that can, it can really take a toll on, on management level people because they're expected to own it. Um, and so we even have employees that go and check on their managers, call them and make sure they're okay and, and really do their job well and work hard, you know, for the benefit of the company, their own family and, and, you know, making sure their manager is good. So this is a, it's a situation, uh, where, uh, this company's really doing a lot of things right organizationally. I mean, certainly we, you know, we, we like to think we have, you know, great technology too, and and other other things that that are of value here. But when it comes to just how people treat each other, um, how they uh, encourage each other, um, how you see, you know, people help each other even in other departments that have really nothing to do with them, it's really quite refreshing. Oh, I'm glad to, that you found a nice home there that you can be comfortable. Uh, one of the things you mentioned in your blog was uh, ownership and how employees think about ownership. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. Um, I think that uh, one of the, the problems that, that I've seen in several, you know, I've been an employee for a long time. Uh, I've also been an employer. And I think uh, a sense of ownership is one of the, the overriding problems in today's market you have folks that are always out to quote get mine. It's it's I got to get mine. You know, never mind that the company only has so much money to go around for everybody. Uh, never mind that you may already be overpaid and you're asking for more, or the company is is strapped. You know, so of course there's those people who are the absolute opposite of that. You know, that that are willing to forego their salary uh, for a whole year uh, and live off of savings for the benefit of the company. I've seen that here, but what really that I would like to get a message across to those that are always looking out for themselves and never really considering the fact that the company as a whole has other employees to feed, um, other employees to help. And, and all this is, you know, during this, this uh, meltdown that uh, the economy has just gone through, most of us were lucky to have any job. You know, if you were making six figures, you were the one of the most blessed people ever, and you should be insanely grateful to somebody. Uh, so I think rather than having a, a, a self, you know, centric view of the world, think of it as a team. Be thankful for for your role, even if it's not optimal. Um, you know, be thankful for the money you make, even though you know you could make some, you know, maybe uh, more money somewhere else. But you know, perhaps your company's been pretty good to you, even though they couldn't pay you as much. There's there's a lot of facets that go into the taking ownership. Uh, but I think that if you think about the company as your own company. That's where the ownership comes in. If if it was your company and all the money that was spent comes out of your checking account and all the people hired, you knew um, everything about these people and how they fit into their job and, and things like this. You were the owner. How would you work then? Would you put in long hours? Would you uh, you know, hide expenses and, and, you know, under the sweep them under the carpet and, you know, mix them in with things where, you know, it, it uh, really shouldn't have been. Would you buy things you shouldn't be buying uh, you know, their their luxuries, not essentials, those kind of things. Treat the company as though it's your company. Um, I think if more employees, whether they're a, a VP or they're an engineer or they're in accounting, it doesn't matter. If they if they treat the company as though it's 100% theirs, I think companies would would uh, see a lot more success. I think employees would. Uh, be a lot happier. People wouldn't leave as much. It would be a good scenario all the way around. 
Well, it's a little uh, unique hearing uh, Devin Aiken, the Devinator, talking about a soft skill rather than technology, but it's kind of refreshing. I appreciate that. Uh, another thing you'd mentioned, uh, and I, I, I really, I really like this uh, this quote you had was uh, about a question: Do you bring the company more money than you're paid? I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, being a business owner myself, and also having been an employee, uh, if you're not bringing more into the company than you're paid, you got some soul searching to do. I, th- I think so. Um, this is a, a scenario where everybody likes to think that they're worth a lot. I mean, but uh, worth a lot is is very um, ethereal, right? It's how much are you worth? How much money do you make the company? If you sit down and, and try to figure that out, you might actually be able to. Uh, you know, I'm a high-tech guy, so I'll use a, a scenario that I understand well as, a, as an example. Suppose that you're a systems engineer or uh, a, a sales, a field sales uh, account executive or regional sales manager, something like that where you can tie concrete income to, um, uh, you know, to your role. Um, look at how much – gross profit um, that you bring in, not not just revenue. You know, if you bring in a, a half million dollars in revenue, um, how much of that is actual profit when you uh, when you look at, you know, you're, you took out a certain percentage for your uh, for your commission and the company has a certain amount of overhead and, and the cost of goods for whatever it is you're selling costs a certain amount. And if you look at the, the gross profit at the end of the day um, and do that for a whole year, are you losing the company money or are you making the company money? And it should be everybody's goal to always be effective and efficient enough to make the company more money. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the position, by by uh, many times over two or ten times as much money uh, as as you're making. And of course, it's the more money you make, the more important this becomes. You know, if you're you know a, a thirty thousand dollar a year employee, it's it's uh it's one thing. But if you're a two hundred thousand dollar employee, somebody on the very very top. You know, you really need to consider, you know, if you go to a meeting uh, where you've got, uh, you know, three or four more guys, that your, your pay scale sitting there, how much is this meeting costing? Uh, just the meeting might cost $1,000 an hour. Well, is that meeting productive? So you want to be maximally productive and efficient, uh, you know, in order to do this. And, and it's certainly you should be given the number of hours that you're getting paid for. So I think that this is a soul searching thing that everybody should do and they should be honest about it, not – not vague or just assume that they're worth a lot just because they feel important. They should actually take a good look at this. That's a sense of ownership. I like, I like the thought. That's a good thought. Uh, and since this topic is on, uh, you know, it's all about the people, uh, what about the difference between experienced people who are already working in the company and uh, the turnover or the churn rate that some uh, vendors and uh, even, you know, field people go through in our industry? Yeah, I think that's a, a great topic, Keith. Um, here's the way I feel about it. You know, a person gets a lot of training and they get years of experience, perhaps with a technology or a product, and that person gets to be extremely efficient at their job. Now, uh, a, a person that's, uh, you know, in that position, let's let's say, you know, again, something I'm familiar with, uh, systems engineering, this person gets to be uh, very good at their job and they they don't waste a lot of time doing things that, that don't have a, a big impact. And so uh, this, this person is, it's now worth a lot of money, uh, in a gen- generally speaking, if they're doing a good job at, at what they're doing. But um, if you weigh that against a newcomer, even if this, this newcomer may, uh, may not know your product, may know the technology, let's say, but they don't know your product, they've got a learning curve. Um, then they've got you know, an efficiency curve. And then they've got relational curve. You know, if they're, you know, the customers, they have to learn the customers, the customer base. There's a lot of facets to these things that this first guy that got all the experience that, that this first guy knows. So if you let, uh, you know, if you let the, the experience walk out the door, you've got a major setback. First, it's likely that your competitor just inherited a very experienced guy. And then the, the, the second part of that is that you know, the person coming in has got this long ramp-up curve where you're going to lose money the whole time. It's, it's almost a given that you're going to uh, lose money during this period. This person's going to cost you more than they make you. So it should be a priority uh, for most companies to keep the experienced people, you know, keep, keep those guys happy. Now, there's a certain limit to that. I think that there's a, there's a nice balance between 
uh, take for the employee to take ownership to say, you know, um, if I were the owner of this company, I wouldn't pay me, you know, this unbelievably ridiculous salary that I suddenly asked for because I felt important. You know, there's something that's fair. Maybe I make a lot of money, um, you know, but it's fair because I make them way more than that. Okay, that's that's a good argument. But if you're sure that you do that. So I think that there's a there's a happy balance between you know the person taking ownership and being fair about their salary, um, but at the same time the company should realize that uh, experience is is very valuable and just having turnover of staff uh, constantly bringing in new guys constantly that's that's not a good move for a company. Now I'll tell you that that uh, Arrowhive is uh, in particular is, is quite good at keeping experienced people. Um, we've got uh, our systems engineers are a good example of that. We don't have any junior level systems engineers. Every single one is senior level, and we've been able to keep them here. And that's uh, a testament to how the company is managed. Well, thank you for your time today talking about it's all about the people. Any uh, last comments you want to make uh, tied to this topic about the value of people? Other than the fact that uh, just to reiterate that uh, employees are the most valuable asset a company has, uh, that that fact gets lost on a lot of people over time. Everybody gets focused on the mission at hand and sales and numbers and intellectual property and, and you know, we have this, you don't, that kind of thing. And they forget uh, to focus on inward on their people and taking care of their people and making sure their people are happy. You know, happy people are more productive people. Happy people make better teammates and, and set a better um, tone and environment, uh, you know, relational environment within the company. So, uh, my advice to managers is to constantly, uh, challenge yourself to take care of your people, you know, whether it's, a, you know, looking at people's comp plans and making sure they're treated fairly. That's something that should be proactive, not reactive. You don't want to wait till an employee comes to you and says, Hey, I'm underpaid. Well, Already, this person is probably looking for a job elsewhere, and if not, they're pretty upset already, or they wouldn't be coming to you. So being proactive in taking care of care of people, whether it's a comp plan or a job role or anything like that, is is a very, uh, very smart way to go. I've, I've been on both sides of that table uh, multiple times, and I can tell you that proactive is always better than reactive. Well, good. Well, I appreciate the time we've spent together here today talking about people. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back on the podcast. Uh, maybe other times we can talk about other soft skills as your uh, experience changes in this new role. And of course, we'll be talking to you more about uh, more of the standard Devonator technical things. So thanks for your time, Devin. <laughs> thanks, Keith. Well, I'd like to thank all of our contributors who have helped out on today's podcast. Uh, Joel Barrett, Avert Bopp, Marcus Burton, Adam Conway, and Devin Aiken all uh, supported today's podcast. We're grateful for your support. If you have any feedback or questions or uh, desires like what you'd like to see in the podcast, uh, please go out and uh, leave a message on the feedback line, or you can email feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. Uh, we would uh, appreciate if you uh, share the news about Wireless Land Weekly with your friends, neighbors, and others. And uh, thanks for your time, and we'll see you next week. Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the needs of wireless land professionals. We look forward to your feedback. Please leave your comments at the bottom of the show notes, or email feedback on the show can be sent to feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail feedback, just call 24-7 and leave a message at 1-801-481-9018. Until next time, this has been another production of wirelesslandprofessionals.com, a place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. 